minutes, you know? Yeah, I have uh, 20 minutes, 25. Yeah, yeah, I try my best. I'm going to read. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Mm. So thank you very much for coming back in time. And now the really big lecturers are coming, the alumni. Yeah? And uh, we are more and more proud on that, that uh, students going also internationally on stage from our group. This is the best promotion I can dream, and also as a mentor, and also publishing. Also, uh, the next uh, speaker is coming from Canada, and there's uh, Dr. Win. And uh, he's uh, getting his uh, ceremony, his Master of Science certification, 2014, so three years ago. And I think he's also very bonded to us, as a, also as a tutor for the next students to help them in master theses. And um, he will give us now a lecture which is uh, not uh, related to his master thesis because um, he is going on and this is always my dream that you not stop with one topic in your life doing with your master thesis that you also look a little bit left and right and doing the next and the next research or developing a new protocol or whatever and present it or publish it this is the best what we can have and he is talking about a very hot topic and you have it already heard from Dr. Park the so-called socket shield technique which was introduced about five six years from uh, Mark Hürzela and Otto Sur, one of whom we have already as a lecturer in, on the, on the other one we are struggling now <laughs> to Mark. And uh, his topic is what you see already here on the screen, the socket shield technique as a subset of immediate implants in the aesthetic zone. And he suggested you a protocol and uh, we have enough time to discuss it later interactive because uh, he's uh, compromising it to uh, about 20 minutes and this is also not easy to tell everything in a short time and to be pointed on the big things. So give some hands uh, to Dr. Wynn, yeah, that is coming as an alumni here and uh, present us his uh, technique and protocol for this uh, everyone now knowing uh, socket shield technique. on the technique and standardized clinical protocol hello okay is it too much uh, there's few publications on the techniques and a standardized clinical protocol for the socket shield treatment in an aesthetic zone is presently non-existent. When I started my first field case of socket shield about five years ago, there wasn't much literature available on the technique. So it was actually the work of Hugh Zeller that inspired me to look further into the possibility of this, uh, of this treatment modality. Since only my, uh, my, one of my passions in implantology is immediate implant in the aesthetic zone, with time, I have learned to follow a certain principle to obtain predictable result. Adapting the socket shield concept as a subset of immediate implant, uh, which is more understood and more research, seems to be a natural thing to do. I start my presentation by reviewing a predictable protocol for the immediate implant in the aesthetic zone with uh, the rationales derived from the current understanding of tissue behavior, biomaterials, and clinical procedures. 
I will then apply this treatment model to suggest a working concept for the socket shield technique. And finally, I will show you a few cases that I have done applying the same treatment protocol. Hoping, hoping that in having a standardized treatment protocol, more meaningful studies will be done to make this wonderful technique a paradigm shift in our clinical practice. Where does immediate implant stand in the, uh, in the contemporary implantology? PubMed search on immediate implants has shown a steady increase in the numbers of studies during the last 15 years, from 100 articles in 2000 to 500 articles in 2016. There is definitely a growing interest in these subjects. The survival, uh, the recent systematic reviews have confirmed that immediate implant could be a predictable option in implant therapy. The advantages include faster treatment time, less extensive surgical procedure, lowered cost, and less patient suffering. Properly done, the natural heart and soft tissue can be faithfully preserved. The last article, recognize the name? Dr. Weigel and uh, Tony Strangio is my classmate in MOI 6. It's a very good read. What is the current concept for the predictable implant, immediate implant placement? Let's start with the exception, uh, extraction socket. Needless to say that an atraumatic extraction helps with minimizing the, the damage of heart and soft tissue and it helps with wound healing and visibility of the surgical field. We can divide the extraction socket into four different zones, each of which has its own characteristics. Buckle zone is the most important zone in dental implantology. A very high number of peri-implantitis appears to have the implant violating the, the biological tolerance of this zone. An important percentage of bone shrinkage appears after the tooth is removed, up to 50% during the first year. Most of the bone loss appears in the buccal zone. In an animal study, histologic study in 2005, Arauco and Lindell have demonstrated that trauma and loss of periodontal ligaments trigger an osteoclastic activity causing alveolar bone resorption. Compared to natural healing, socket preservation has significantly less horizontal and vertical bone loss, and it seems to be the same in immediate, immediate implant treatment. Remember this number of a horizontal bone loss even after the socket preservation the thicker peri-implant soft tissue seems to have positive effect on the crest on bone level. An implant treatment guide has suggested that a safe zone for implant placement is within one millimeter and a half, lingual to a tangent line that connects the root surface of natural, adjacent natural teeth. For immediate implant, this so-called safe zone is no longer safe since the buccal bone modeling will end up just palatal to this zone. Placing an implant there will have a high possibility of the implant losing its buccal bone support, thus tissue recession or worse. In my opinion, the whole buccal zone should be considered a danger zone, and implants should be placed away from this zone. There are two ways to help your implant maintaining the sufficient bone buffer on the buckle of the, the implant, choosing a smaller diameter implant or placing it more palatally. This palatal position also facilitates fabrication of screw-retained crown. Now the smaller the diameter of the implant and more palatally it's, it is placed, the deeper it should be inserted to maintain the, pro the immersion profile of the, the prosthesis. 
That means subcrestone placement. And now the concept of subcrestone placement is only pertaining to a certain uh, limited number of implant system. So please choose your, your system, proper system for this procedure. Ideally, the vertical soft tissue should be between three to four millimeters, according to Thomas's and Linkovicius, allowing two millimeter barrier epithelium and 1.5 millimeter of connective tissue attachment. Grafti grafting the buccal gap and immediate temporization together have the most positive impact on the crestal bone and the maintaining of the soft tissue profile, according to the study done by Tarnow in 2015. Even with the bone graft, we know now that there will be 1.5 millimeter of horizontal net bone loss, which will translate to buccal concavity and dark shadow of the soft tissue. A buccal soft tissue augmentation in the form of connective tissue, gra a tissue graft placed anywhere, any uh, sorry, sorry, any time during the length of the treatment will help with compensate for this deficiency. Palatone zone. Thick bone and soft tissue in this zone may account for less tissue loss in this region compared to the buccal side of an extraction socket. An immediate implant placed against the palatone also helps with implant stability. Proximal or papillary zone. Tissue loss in this area compromises the shape of the papilla. Thus, less aesthetic, uh, thus affects the aesthetic outcome. In natural dentition, the shape of the papilla is decided by the, crest the remaining proximal, proximal bone and, of course, the distance between the teeth. It's been ob observed that in natural, de natural teeth, the papilla always present in the dis uh, if the distance from the prox proximal bone to the proximal contact area is within five millimeters. But more than that, we start to see the loss of the papilla. By knowing the interproximal bone remaining on the adjacent natural teeth, the final papilla level can be predicted. And this is a very important factor in treatment planning in the aesthetic region. In this example, mesial and distal papilla are filled nicely because the distance from the crest of the natural proximal bone to the proximal contact area is within five millimeters. Notice, however, that the crestal bone adjacent to the, imp uh, the implant shoulder is a lot more apical. This brings us to the second, uh, to another observation by Joseph Kahn. Can. The height of the papilla is dependent on the level of the proximal bone on the natural teeth but not that of the adjacent implant. So an implant can be placed deep and you will not lose a papilla if, if the proximal bone height of the natural teeth is within five millimeters from the pro contact point. Apicone zone. A high percentage of hopeless teeth that need to be removed involve periapicone abscesses or granuloma. Evidence suggests that implants can be placed into an infected site following a thorough deridement of the socket. Sometimes apical surgery together with implant surgery is needed for proper, proper deridement. The apical bone provides most of the implant stability so choose the length of your implants accordingly. Another important consideration when placing an immediate, immediate implant is the direction of the axis of the implant, which dictates the position of the screw hole. Since the shape of the alveolar process varies greatly, the preparation needs to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis.
This is an example illustrating the principle and technique. Root fracture with lateral periodontal uh, abscess. Typical, typical thin buccal bone plate. Implant placement in the direction of the cingulum, allowing more than two millimeters of buccal gap. The treatment was done according to the immediate protocol atraumatic extraction, small implant diameter, placed toward the palatal aspect, subcrestal placement allowing thick vertical soft tissue, and proper immersion profile. Xenograft placed at the buccal space. Soft tissue augmentation, which is almost always required to compensate for bone shrinkage. Immediate temporization. Stable tissue after three years post-op. Despite the excellent outcome, immediate implants is still have some drawbacks. Bone modeling after the extraction will occur regardless of in, uh, in implant placement immediately. Both heart and soft tissue grafts are still needed to rebuild the original ridge contour. Before the socket shield technique was introduced, no clinical procedure had been documented to prevent the change in the buccal morphology of the extraction socket in an absolute way. Although no long-term evidence has been reported, the socket shield technique has clinically shown good promise in maintaining original rich morphology. The root of the tooth is sectioned in such a way that a thin fragment of the root of or the shield is left attached to the buccal bone, while the rest of the root is removed. As the labrum periodontal attachment is left un undisturbed, no osteoclastic activity seems to be triggered labial to the shield. An immediate implant is placed in the same protocol described previously, but without additional bone or gum graft. The concept of root retention is not new. Submerged vital or non-vital roots in both animal and human studies show the formation of new bone and periodontal attachment on the top of the root. And it appears to help preserve bone volume. Hugh Zeller and co-workers coined the term socket shield in an animal histologic study. New cementum was observed to form on the internal surface of the shield and found deposited on the implant surface when the implant is in contact with the shield. With the sh shield. Although most studies on the suction shield technique have been presented in K-series, a few large studies have shown encouraging results. One study done on 46 patients observed 100% survival rate with good crestal bone stability up to five years. Another split mouth control study show a socket shield technique demonstrate better aesthetic outcome and tissue changes compared to the conventional immediate implant technique. And a recent study by Daniel Bomer's group they superimpose scans of the before and after models to compare rich profiles of the implant size. Five years results show very stable, rich dimension and healthy period implant soft tissue. I now will present the indications, contraindications, and the suggested protocol for the socket shield. Indication. It can be used as an alternative to immediate implant placement in the aesthetic zone. In cases that require higher, uh, high aesthetic result, where additional heart and soft tissue augmentation is not desirable, such as cost issue or patient's preference. 
indication, indication for minimum invasive implant treatment such as in older population. Contraindications. Periodontal disease. Tooth mobility. Deep pocket associated with bone loss. Active infection. Vertical root fracture, root resorption involving the buccal <coughs> fragment. And buccal bone alteration is necessary at the implant site. For an example, bone graft is needed to change the vertical bone level. The protocol. There are three considerations that I will discuss. The preparation of the shield, the position of the implant, and the prosthesis. Preparation of the shield. The three vertical position of the shield relative to the buccal crestal bone. Above the crestal bone, flush with the bone crest, or below the bone crest. Which one should we use? By leaving the shield one millimeter above the buccal bone crest, the connective tissue attachment is left undisturbed. This position is basically apical to the epithelial attachment and at the base of the pocket depth. If we cut the shield down to the level of the bone crest, the attachment apparatus will be compromised and tooth biologic width will be violated, theoretically leading to gingival inflammation and recession. Placing it lower than the bone crest would defeat the whole purpose of the technique, and recession should be expected. Now, this is only, only my observation and personal experience. It should be subjected to further study. The size of the shield is such that, as such that it should be as large for its intended purpose, which is to protect the buccal bone, but it should be as small as possible so not to, be, to compete with the osteogenic potential of the available bone wall within the socket. The shield should be beveled so as not to come in contact with the abutment or the crown. Avoid sharp edges which might, might cause exposure. As an immediate implant, the debridement of the socket is essential. Immediate implant position. Implant position should follow the immediate implant protocol as discussed previously. Small diameter implants. Implant head is placed in the palatal position. Implant should not touch the buccal shield. At least one millimeter subcrestone placement. Four millimeter apical to, to the buccal gingival margin. The smaller the implant diameter and the more palatal the placement, the deeper it should be inserted. Minimum torque is required for immediate temporization. I say 35 Newton centimeter, but it also depends on the, the, the diameter of the implant. If you use five, three millimeter uh, implants, such as in Nobel Active, they recommend 25. Newton centimeter. Bone gra graft in the buccal gap, if it's uh, which is necessary in the immediate implant to reduce the effect of buccal bone modeling, is not es essential with the socket shield technique, since the buccal bone plate doesn't seem to be altered in the presence of the shield. Temporization. As an immediate implant, the temporary crown made at the time of implant insertion helps maintaining the existing ginger bone contour. I plan my implant placement to have a screw retained crown, but it's not always possible depending on the shape of the available bone. As I mentioned previous, uh, previously, direct contact between the shield and the implant the abutment or the crown should be avoided. And the shield should be exposed after the soft tissue should not be exposed after the soft tissue has completed. 
I now will present some clinical cases to demonstrate the suggested protocol. The lower inset image, the original, original condition, uh, condition of the patient seeking treatment to replace missing upper uh, posterior teeth. Shortly after the treatment was completed, two of her crowns in front was fractured at the gum line and the situation required the removal of the, the root and immediate implant treatment using socket shield procedure. The shield just before the, the final preparation. Post op photo and immediate temporization. Ginger bone condition at the time of final impression, usually four months. The impact papilla demonstrates that the buccal bone preservation seems to also have the ability to pres preserve the inter implant soft tissue. Photo of five years post op. The ginger bone tissue appears to be in perfect condition. It's on the right, not on the left. And little dimensional change. Confirmed by the Geomad Magic Engineering software superimposing her scans of the pre op and five years post op. The color mapping show less than 0.3 millimeter discrepancy at the soft tissue region. Another case, 48-year-old patient with fracture lateral incisor. The root was very long and curved with apical granuloma. The adjacent immediate implant was placed two years prior. An apical surgery was performed at the time of implant insertion. A mesoproximal shield was retained, uh, re, um, was retained with the hope to re preserve the bone between the implants. Nowadays, I'm not so sure if the proximal shield is necessary to maintain the inter-implant soft tissue as observed in the previous case. I didn't have enough torque. Socket seal graft was performed. A four months post op, the scar tissue was due to a lousy second stage surgery. I had offered to do a gingivoplasty, but the patient didn't think it's necessary. So I left it there to remind me of my poor planning. Four year post op, you can see the, the, the proximal shield on the x ray. In conclusion, the socket shield technique seems to promise absolute preservation of heart and soft tissue dimension with minimum invasive surgical intervention, cost-effective procedure, and high patient satisfaction. Quality clinical studies are needed to make this technique evidence-based. Thank you very much for your attention. So oh, thank you very much, uh, Win. Uh, very comprehensive uh, lecture. Everybody can now do this cooking book with your animations and drawings. Uh, and we open it for discussion because uh, it looks uh, easy, but I think it's not easy to practice and to realize. And uh, I think there is a lot of questions also of that point. Um, the great, great, great presentation, Benny. Always keep on inspiring me. Um, you just have a question regarding the, your belief, your personal belief. What keeps the soft tissue in place? Is it the part of the, uh, of the shield above the bone, the one millimeter part? And if yes, is it the mechanical uh, factor of that shield pushing the soft tissue, keeping the soft tissue away? Or is it the connective tissue attachment to it? Basically, we try to preserve whatever nature gives, so we don't touch that portion. We know in a long time that if we touch that uh, connective tissue attachment, we will have uh, biologic width uh, impingement. That will cause uh, inflammation and recession. Now, there is other school that uh, uh, suggests to, to cut the shield to the bone level. Um, and I observe many of them. I, I see that 
it depends on also on the thickness uh, on the biotype of the tissue. If you have a strong biotype, you can do like immediate implant and you don't need a connected tissue graft in, a, in, in immediate implant. But if you have a weak biotype, you see the weakness. Uh, you see in this case, because the, you see redness and the tissue appear to be very purplish. Uh, it's not like the case that I present here. So um, I think this original preservation of, uh, of the structure is important in this case. Would you believe if we place anything, any material, to support the soft tissue in place instead of this one millimeter, like a, an immediate crown, uh, would it do the same effect or not? We know that if we do that with, uh, with immediate implant, uh, we will not be, uh, have, uh, be able to maintain the, the thickness of the soft tissue efficiently, like the case that I showed you before when there's the uh, dep depression and the purple, uh, the, the gen in, co in the color of the soft tissue. Uh, some other material, that's the next, uh, next presentation. Very nice as usual. A small technical question: Did, did you have problems? Did you have problems? I shared our your experience with us during seating the crown for immediate provisionalization. Did you have problems where it was hitting or touching or impinging on the shield? And if so, what are your measures to check that and your tricks to? Because uh, is it possible that? I could be pushing the shield without knowing or pushing it downwards or moving it without really that I'm, I can't visualize it. This is something that interests me. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that is a very important issue. If you put on, push on the shield, you would have a pressure. It's like a natural tooth. And we don't know the consequence. You can have more modeling to change like an orthodontic movement. Or if you push it too hard, you will lose it. Uh, so we don't want to do that. So when you do that, you have to make a prof uh, the profile very, very, uh, very flat to avoid. So you have at least half a millimeter of soft tissue also to grow over. Otherwise, you have an exposure of the shield. I have about 50 sh uh, cases, and I do exact protocol of immediate implant because I do more Im immediate implants before. Now I do uh, basically just, uh, uh, just that because I don't want to go back to immediate implant uh, unless I have like infection that involves buckle shields and stuff. Uh, I haven't got a, 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 a failure, not yet. I never have that, no, no. You just be careful, initial step, one by one. Socket, uh, the immediate implant is the same thing. When you do a, a temporary crown, you have to know how to do it right. You know, you, you do it one, but you do it well, you polish it well so you don't have problem. Same with the shield, you know that the buckcorn shield is there. So avoid touching that. Be very careful, shave it like, uh, shave it, bevel it so that avoid all the shield, because you don't need thickness, you need just, just there, it's present, you know. So I, I suggest uh, make a small textbook on this, because you have now the knowledge about 50 cases, amazing, and uh, it's working because you don't have a, let me say, a failure, and we believe you, we were very honest, and uh, this is my recommendation to you. It takes a lot of time, but the socket shield is in every uh, fair discussion. And we are proud. We have also now a master thesis. I invite him next year. He do a randomized controlled trial on socket shield. He has now the one year data, but only for eight cases or seven cases. But we see the same, yeah. Everything goes smooth and there's no resorption and nothing because he follow up uh, this with Combium CT pictures. But this is for next year. Uh, once again, summarize it. This is very important. Not only make it, tell, show everybody what you do. It's really, really nice. I just have a last comment. This, uh, if you start with soccer shield, don't go to posterior teeth. 
The anterior teeth is extremely also very difficult to prepare. The back teeth are extremely almost impossible to do it well. And you usually will leave the breeze or, or root fragment that infected, you will, you will ask for problems. So concentrate on area that you can use and then venture down to lower in anterior and then start. But I don't think, because of the buccal bone and the posterior teeth are known to be thicker, so the amount of resorption is a lot less than anterior teeth. We, do, we question if it's really necessary to go through this step. So give him the hands, uh, really nice. <laughs> so please make, uh, make a textbook that uh, the alumni gets famous more. So now I'm very happy to announce also alumni. It's Eric, Eric Lennartsen from Sweden. He's graduating in 2013, so four years ago. And I have to tell you, I think um, he's really addicted to get more knowledge. Because this is a student, uh, he see a lecture or a hands-on, and uh, then he say, oh, this is a good guy. I go to his office. And I want to learn everything. Yeah, it doesn't matter which kind of uh, lecture it is. Uh, it was really amazing, and so he's never stopped to learn and to 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 make it better. And uh, he make a master thesis about his uh, work about sinus flow elevation with or without grafting, and with lateral window. But now he's changing completely another topic. And this is always what I say. Four years later, they do some other fields, and he's talking about gingival display a digital new way of planning whatever it means i don't see this lecture before but i trust him so please the stage is on you eric thank you thank you very much i haven't seen the lecture either but I, i'll i'll try to do as good, as good as i can well dear colleagues and paul weigel thank you very much for inviting me and dear colleagues i'm just like you i love teeth and beautiful teeth should be shown and the lecture is about this. This is not turning on. Oh. The wrong cord. OK. Um, so I often get the question how I perform aesthetic crown lengthening and I, I thought it would be a great opportunity today to, to show you my treatment modality for these patients. So I want to start out off by saying that um, I don't get any payment whatsoever from any of the products that uh, I will show today and um, none of the pictures shown today have been manipulated except every single picture of myself. So my name is Eric Lennartsen and I'm completely uh, focused and committed on implants and uh, aesthetic microsurgery in my private uh, practice in Stockholm. So let's start off by talking about gingival display. Um, it's according to literature it's aesthetic aesthetically pleasing to show somewhere in in between zero and two millimeters uh, above the central incisors so i have to say that i think this smile is very pleasing i have to say this because this is my wife but um, having a two millimeter uh, gingival display can also be very, very pleasing. But sometimes patients are referred to my office because they show too much soft tissue. Uh, like this patient here. In this patient, she has, uh, the, the teeth has erupted to its final position. The incisal edge position is correct. But the soft tissue did not recede. And this phenomena is called an altered eruption. We will talk a lot about this patient for, um, later on in my presentation, but she has a wide band of keratinized tissue. So here we can reduce the soft tissue about the teeth uh, to, to show more enamel. And if a patient like this shows up to your office and doesn't have a lot of keratinized tissue, 
you of course need to to do a different procedure and and that would be an apical positioned flap so this is not a very beautiful smile is it Paul Weigel you would not like to kiss this girl would you <laughs> no but she's 25 years old and but just looking at this picture she looks much younger she looks like a child doesn't she well thank you for the encouragement uh, so this was altered eruption uh, of course there are many other um, factors why, why there's too much soft tissue malpositioning um, in the healthy dentition can also be one possible option and a super super strong uh, super strong muscles uh, smiling muscles can be another factor and of course uh, we have patients with a long face syndrome uh, which we of course need to treat in a completely different manner so the first easy case this is actually not done by me it's done by my my colleague Michael in my office uh, this is uh, um, the tooth number uh, 12 is placed the root is is quite far back to the palate and it's an easy treatment because there's there's no <coughs> buccal bone interfering with with uh, uh, reducing the soft tissue so he's just used the laser and placed a hundred percent additive uh, veneer on top and this is like a two-year result but then here is Josephine again she she is referred for aesthetic crown lengthening and this is her smile pictures and uh, she has beautiful sexy teeth but we just need to expose them further and how can we do the, this in a predictable and safe way so as you see here on the picture to your right, at rest she shows approximately four millimeters of the uh, incisal and that leads us to think that it's of course impossible to further um, to lengthen the teeth to the incisal. We need to of course uh, remove soft tissue in order to bring out uh, her full smile. So, the technique I'm going to talk about today, uh, are, I'm going to describe a little bit later. But so this is uh, the, the line for the smile design. We would like to, to reduce soft tissue on the both centrals and also tooth number 12. So, at the end of treatment, we will have a smile... Um, seen it line looking like this with the laterals just a little bit shorter than the centrals and the canines so it all starts with a um, trio surface scan this is paired with the CBCT and um, included in in the the three shape implant studio software we control that the pairing uh, has is correct and then we can start our measurements tooth by tooth we can measure we can oh I'm sorry we can now measure there we go uh, I can measure of course the bone and the root support enamel and how much of the enamel that we can expo expose of, and it would be terrible to at the at the final checkup to to have exposed her roots that would be a major disaster of a treatment like this so we want to expose uh, all the enamel but not more than that uh, we can also calculate how much soft tissue reduction we can do and if we need to to reduce the bone the buccal bone volume as well so for tooth number one one uh, more than two millimeters of enamel can be exposed 
And from the current CNIT to the buckle bone, there's three and a half millimeters. The distance is three and a half millimeters. So I would like to expose a little bit more than two millimeters of enamel, but that would lead us to have only like a millimeter, 1.3 millimeters from the CNIT to the final CNIT to the buccal bone. And that will, of course, violate the biological width. And that will lead to a chronic inflammation or the soft tissue will just grow back. So this you all know about, uh, the biological width. The biological width plus a healthy sulcus in the uh, aesthetic zone leads us to approximately three millimeters. So in this case, of course, we need to reduce uh, not only the soft tissue, but also hard tissue. Then we give this information tooth by tooth to our dental technician who makes a wax up. Then he makes a surgical guide for us. These days, this surgical guide, of course, everything is sent digitally. And then the inf uh, he designs the guide for me and it's printed in my form labs printer in my office. So here is the surgical guide and during surgery I can use the the lower arch to reduce the soft tissue. Then I can raise the flap and then I can reduce the bone volume on the upper arch and this plastic piece here is three millimeters and it um, represent the sulcus and the biological width. So it makes r the surgery really, really easy. So now we will take a look at the video of Josephine's surgery. <coughs> I'm sorry, but it's supposed to be um, speeded up three times, but uh, I did not get that to work. So. This movie will take seven minutes, so it's a little bit longer than expected. Maybe, Paul, you could bring out some buttered popcorn? So I normally start out with the SR mic microblade. Um, however, I found that there's another blade, that a bendable tunnel blade that has a flat surface that actually use, uh, works better. I will show you show you that on yeah here it comes that's the that's the bendable uh, microblade uh, for a tunnel preparation but it works great for these uh, these cases I use um, loops systems uh, from Germany uh, it's called uh, StarMed and with these loops, I, you, you, I have six times magnification, and they also have a camera that is connected to the loops, and all my movies are recorded this way. So what you see is actually almost identical to what I see during surgery. And especially if you want to do surgical movies in, in the posterior part of, the, of, of, of your patients, uh, this camera system is really, really great. Uh, StarMed, yeah. StarMed is a company, and the camera is called StarCam, yeah. So now the soft tissue reduction is is completed, and I introduce now a SR microblade into the sulcus. And Dr. Soar told told me and or taught me that. It's very important when we cut through papillas that we go from one side to the other and not back again. So I really try to come in deep in the interproximal and only go from the, from the distal to the mesial. Because if I would go from the, <coughs> from the mesial to the distal again, I could cross cut the papilla. And that will leave a... Um, a, a papilla with, with a big chance of secondary healing and, and loss of volume. Um, it, 
it's always great to have a um, one of your nurses keeping the area wet the whole time to keep the, the, the soft tissue really flexible. I will be releasing a micro scalpel holder that actually sprinkles water by itself next year and uh, that, will, that will reduce the cost by one employee in my office. So this is really tiny surgery. We only raise the flap minimally uh, on the buckle side of course. I use the ins microsurgical instruments from Sur and Hirzler and I think they work great. After finishing the MOI, I, I went to, uh, actually it was Paul that, uh, that um, uh, got me into the course at, at Sur and Hirzler and, and it was, the, I think there was the fourth course, was the periplastic surgery and oh, I thought I was the man, you know. I sat down there and this newly graduated dentist sat beside me and this girl had taken all the steps before uh, at their courses and she outperformed me in every single step of every surgery that weekend. And then I decided I really need to change my concepts. I need to start from the beginning, from course one and it has been a great journey. So for those of you that haven't been to, to, to the center in Munich, I highly recommend it. Okay, uh, here we have uh, just the, the uh, uh, straight uh, handpiece, diamond burrs, and I reduce the bone thickness. I do not remove all the bone to the root surface. I reduce the thickness and then I um, sort of apply a pressure and remove the final bit of, of bone in order not to, de to um, destroy the, the, the root surface. I do this tooth by tooth, taking the guide on and off to constantly have a good measurement and a good reference point um, to work from. What a lot of cases I did previous, I did not reduce the thickness on the remaining bone and the cases did not look very good afterwards. So you really need to thin out the buckle bone on every single tooth that you, you do this procedure on. Highly recommended. And finally, of course, it's super important to, to, to clean the root surface in order uh, for um, so the soft tissue will not regrow and reattach. So really clean the root surface very, very carefully. And the, um, my incision in this case, of course we could make an incision and leave the papillas as well. But I've had some cases with some nasty scar tissue in, in the, th that zone. So preferably nowadays I use this technique. And finally we, we place um, vertical uh, mattress sutures, uh, preferably a monofilament 7-0. And it normally heals really, really good. Um, always of course a little bit nervous or, or uh, anxious to see if all the papillas will fill the interproximal space. And as you see on this case, after, at suture removal it doesn't, but after a few months later it, it sure does. So, okay, I think we can stop the movie there. So this is some pictures from the surgery, the surgical guide in place after soft tissue reduction the bone reduction is now completed and suturing and this is Josephine about a week later you see that we lost a little bit of papilla height in, in the central and here we were supposed to have a final checkup but she had 
had a bicycling accident, so I had to, to take her back again, and I asked her to, to, to put on some makeup, and this is before and after. Now she's kissable, isn't she, Paul? And then this is before and after. <laughs> yeah. So, do I have another five, ten minutes, or do you want me to stop now? I think we should discuss Yeah, okay, it's better to do that. So, first of all, thank you for your lecture. Thank you. Eric, det var jätteroligt. <laughs> Tack. Congratulations. Uh, I would like to have a short question. In case you would like to perform veneers after that, yes, from whatever reason, how long would you wait after the surgery before you start veneering? I, I would say the, the longer you wait, the better it is. But at least three months. At least. Yeah. Because the people say six months, uh, nine months. We, we have done cases earlier than that with my colleague, um, but um, we have had some, some drawbacks so as well. Three, four months, so it's... Uh, yeah. Much three, four months, it's very stable. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, she was referred by a plastic surgeon, and she went on to have lip surgery after after this treatment. So I didn't care about that at all. But uh, I don't I don't normally perform uh, uh, phrenectomies, except it's a it's a uh, it's a recession case where I'm supposed to do uh, soft tissue augmentation. I'm sorry. Yeah. So if you're doing aesthetic prep. Yeah. But as she came from the plastic surger, surgeon, uh, he, he were going to, to work on her lip after this surgery. And actually, she went on having veneers after this treatment as well, which I thought was her teeth are so beautiful as they are. But that's life. Okay, any more questions? Yeah? Technical qu uh, question about uh, Implant Studio. Um, d do you fool Implant Studio into thinking that there's an implant to be planned? Because how, how do you get past the, the, uh, the setup? Yes. Do you just arbitrarily choose a tooth for implanting? And yeah, and, and, and even now I have to, to design temporary crowns for that implant, which is normally placed at, in the tuberosity in the upper jaw. Okay. But I just place the implant there and, and uh, uh, also the temporary crown. Oh, gotcha. okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Have you used Implant Studio? I use it every day. Yeah. yeah. And do you also pre-order the temporaries? Um, I have the lab software as well, so I, I'll, I'll use the, the, the continuous workflow. So I'll use, um, do my implant planning and then extend it into the lab, lab side of the software. Oh, okay. And, and mill provisionals in-house. Yeah. That's what I do as well. But the indexing from Strauman is incorrect. So I have done 122 single implants with temporization now. And the index indexation is, is wrong right. in every single case. Oh, is that right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Systematic error. Yeah. <laughs> yep. In the case of uh, thin biotype, would you cut it off like this one, or you would replace it, uh, place it apically? Do you because you did, you did it in a different way. You did with micro, micro surgery stuff, and, and, and you, did, you did it in a more delicate way. Yeah. So uh, are we talking about a thin soft tissue or a tissue that's not keratinized? Thin. 
If it's thin and keratinized, I would do this. But normally if it's really thin, it's not keratinized enough so you can reduce uh, soft tissue with a scalpel. And then you have to do, make an apical position flat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You say that the, the, the procedure is very simple, yes. but you spend so much time with technician to make the template. Yeah. Why don't you just use the laser and the simple uh, floss pressing and do the laser very quickly to do ground lengthening? Yes. So you don't need to spend the uh, fee for technician. And the, the, as also patient yeah. doesn't lose so much money I, from I the agree. pocket. I agree. If, if, if the bone would have been further, further away, so I could just reduce the soft tissue, I would for sure just press the floss and use the laser, 100%. But if I do that and then raise the flap, and the flap is moving around in the area, I, for me anyway, I think it's quite difficult to find the exact correct spot for where the hard tissue should be for every single tooth. So if it's only soft tissue, I would do that any day in the week. But when I also need to reduce the bone, I, I like to have this guide. It gives me a lot of com comfort. Yes? From my, from my experience, from my experience, from this case, I will use the laser to reduce the gum first. And later on, I use the ultrasonic with the diamonds. Uh, Cutting yes. and go substantially yeah. to reduce the you bone. Go into the sulcus. Yes, and, and go in yeah. just in the yeah. sulcus, so no flap at all. Yeah. Yeah, and after that, I do a one suture press on one side, and it's enough. Yeah. I need to invest in a laser now. <laughs> <laughs> this was a very expensive uh, yeah. trip here to Germany. So, Eric, how long you stay here? Uh, I leave uh, this afternoon. I know, I know, because he's a party animal too, so I've always... <laughs> <laughs> I had my party by myself last night. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, I say, okay, um, if you can be a little bit more here, if somebody wants to see the next case on his uh, notebook, uh, I think you go out and show him, because yeah. it was very interesting, but I think it's also necessary to have a discussion yes, it is. with your classmates and your alumni. Yeah? Thank you very much for coming in, and uh, he's always busy, and um, we hope that we see you again, um, and sure. uh, thank you for supporting this uh, MOI Alumni Congress. Thank you Thank you much. so much for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. Of course. So, then a classmate of Eric is coming, uh, Nils Pade. And uh, Niels uh, has also an interesting career because sometimes I ask uh, the alumni, uh, okay, what do you do after you get the certification? Uh, you're really now bankrupt or you're going up? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy because it's not only to get a new level of competence because mostly, not always, a uh, new level of competence is also <laughs> linked to really good success in uh, being uh, yeah, a dentist or make establishment of a new clinic. And he is now on the board of a clinic chain. And I think this kind of graduation will help you for this a little bit. And so. uh, we are very happy because he has a master thesis uh, four years ago. He's also presenting it. It was a very nice lecture. I was really impressed. And uh, he said, hey, Paul, why we should have a new topic? I have the new long-term data on this topic. And I say, wow, yes, we do. Uh, please, the stage is on you, Nils Pari, for your uh, experience in the aperture on unsplinted implants. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me, Paul, uh, and for the faculty of the MOI. It's been a great experience taking the master exam here. Since I'm a practitioner, this is the Hendrix, Hendrix room, by the way, at one of my surgeries. <clears throat> Here we go. Uh, the topic of the master thesis were long-term success of unsplinted dental implants supporting a maxillary overdenture. That's not a very sexy treatment, but it's a treatment we do a lot in our offices. It's cheap and it works. At least we think so. <clears throat> a little about myself. I did my master's in 2013. I 
previously done a curriculum in 2010. I've been working uh, in the implant business since 1995, 22 years. Uh, the last seven years I've only done implants and reconstructions. Um, I'm the owner of three uh, clinics in uh, Denmark, in sort of major cities. Major cities aren't that big in Denmark, it's a small country, but anyway. And uh, I've sold my clinics to a dental chain, which I'm now on the board on. So um, and we got 63 clinics in Denmark. <coughs> Being a practitioner, you base your uh, treatments on your experience. You might base it on what you learn in courses and so on and so forth. And we did these and I thought when I had to do a master thesis, it might be a great opportunity to look back at these treatments and see, does it really work? Because often we do a couple of treatments and we say, oh, that works and so on. And we are being only human. We uh, often forget the cases that didn't work and focus on the cases that work. So it could be interesting to see from a scientific point of view, does it really work? And I think taking the master has really led me the way into a scientific field, which I think is very interesting and helped me develop my practice. <clears throat> this is going to be very boring, the first part, so I'll go very quickly through it. Uh, it's a lot of text. So working out with this treatment, does it actually work? Uh, and we uh, evaluate it from the survival of implants and the quality of the survived implants. Did they uh, mainly buy, uh, did they display peri-implantitis? And then also the satisfaction of the patients uh, through improvement of oral health. This is a case I stumbled across, I just think it's interesting. This is one of the most ancient treatments we can provide as a dentist. Full dentures. These lasted for 50 years. She had a front tooth replaced. That's all. Successful treatment. <coughs> Introduction. During the progress of time, refinement of materials, methods, and adaptation to the dentalist yours and appearance of the complete dentures have improved a lot. Nevertheless, retention has always been the big problem. Um, and there's studies showing that not only do we lose bone when we extract teeth, but if we place a denture, a loose denture, on top of the ridge, we will lose even more bone. The introduction of the splinter dental implant supported over denture and unsplinted denture over denture in uh, the late 20th century has given us some new opportunities. We have solved the uh, retention problem and the patients are getting a lot better treatment than even with good uh, complete dentures. And the satisfaction is a lot better. <coughs> and also it has been shown that if you place implants and you put an overdenture over them, the uh, the load on the implant will sort of activate the bone growth, so you, you won't lose as much bone if you have an implant present. In the mandibular, there's numerous of, uh, studies showing that uh, unsplinted mandibular overdentures, uh, that really works. Uh, originally, the the way we did it was we splinted the implants, but studies show that you, you won't get any better implant survival if you splint them or if you don't splint them. So there's no need for splinting them in the mandibular. And that's shown in, uh, in studies. When we go to the maxilla, it's a different case. Numerous studies show that if you splint four implants, it works. And if you've spent five or six, it works as well. But there's actually, I, I only came across one study with unsplinted implants, and that's what I wanted to investigate. This is a study from uh, <coughs> New Zealand, displaying 39 patients provided with three unsplinted implants in the maxilla, and they had a survival rate of 84.6%. 
And often the question we ask, or we are faced with when we do these treatments in the amaxilla, is whether to provide a cemented or screw-retained fixed bridge, or some kind of removable solution. And actually there are studies showing that the patients might be provided with a better function when treated with a removable implant supported overdenture, which will surprise quite a few dentists, I think. <coughs> Materials and methods. The idea was that we looked back and saw what cases had I done. Uh, so it's, it was only me doing the surgery. And uh, we looked at people with four unsplinted Im implants in the maxilla and two unsplinted implants in the mandibular, and people with both. The idea of looking at the mandibular as well was that if I could sort of meet the expectations from literature to unsplinted mandibular over uh, implant supported over dentures, which we got a lot of studies from, then my uh, results from the maxilla would be more reliable. So that's what we did. So the concept was four implants in the upper, placing the two posterior as, posterior as close to the sinus that we could get without doing sinus lifting, two anterior implants, and two implants in the lower, uh, preferably in the first premolar site and the canine site. <coughs> Re-entry about approximately three months later, uh, fitting an attachment, in most cases locators, in a few cases uh, ball attachments, the older ones. And also I did some, uh, I had done some go direct implants, uh, which are uh, a one piece implant with a locator in one end. I won't recommend that, but that's another story. And they were all provided with uh, implant supported over denture with a framework displayed as a horseshoe in chrome cobalt or titanium with an uh, uncovered palate. And the idea of an uncovered palate is very good. All my patients, without exception, says that they go get more intensive flavor uh, sensation when, when they don't have the palate covered. So this is how it looks in vitro, the lower, and in the mouth. So, 85 patient met the uh, inclusion criteria. A few had died, some didn't want to participate, some had moved away, so we ended up with 74, <coughs> 58 mandibulars, and 27 maxilla implanted supported over dentures. And this was the result in 2013. I placed 224 page, uh, implants altogether, 116 in the lower, we lost three, leaving us with 97.41% in survival rate. In the upper, 108, lost four, 104. Survival, 96.13. And now I've re-entered or revisit these patients four years later, and this is the result. Some of them didn't do very well. You see, three patients have died since 2013. Um, I lost an additional one, uh, implant in the lower, so we're down to 96.55. Unfortunately, I lost five in the maxilla, so we're down to 99, and a survival rate of 91.66%. <clears throat> that gives us in the maxilla, which is the most, most interesting, is uh, uh, an approximate survival rate of six, uh, uh, or an average loading time of uh, 6.5 years. <clears throat> the questionnaire findings we did, uh, all but one patient, this is from 2013, we haven't done a questionnaire again, but this is from 2013, and all but one would recommend this treatment. I, f I think she thought the surgery was so bad that she wouldn't recommend it to anybody, <laughs> but, but it's only humans. Um, in general, the patients are statistically more satisfied with the oral health. Denture situation after treatment, 
compared to before treatment. Compared to literature, in the five studies with unsplinted in the mandibular, the survival rate was 96.4. In 2013, we ended up with 97.41, so that was okay. And now we're down to 96.55, so we still got the head above the water. In the maxilla, the only study I could find was 84.61 on free implants. And here we have, in my study, we ended up with 94.33, so that was okay. We have lost an additional five implants in the maxilla, so now we're down to this. And if we look at the splinted cases, because we got studies on that, they got a survival rate of 96.3. So we're lower than that, better than this. I think it's still okay. And you have to remember, when we lose an implant, these are all also integrated implants. It's not that they don't also integrate. This is after loading, we lose them. So when they lose an implant, it's usually due to overloading. I'll explain that later. But then we'll just put a new implant in, and they, while that heals in within three months, they're still using the overdenture. So it's not like the treatment fails. It's one implant that fails. <coughs> Clinical implications. Make sure there's efficient bone, buckle bone, is represented at the implant site. Secure there's enough keratin and gingival tissue. It's available in the peri implant region. Use an implant design with a bacteria tight implant abutment connection, preventing micro leakage, which can introduce peri implantary bone loss. And this goes for every implant you place, really. <coughs> place the po posterior implants in the maxilla as posterior as possible to re reduce the micromechanical lever arm on the overdenture. <coughs> the five maxilla implants we lost were all over to, due to, um, to overloading, really, and, had, and were positioned in regions 13, 14, 23, and 24. Play it safe, use only two-stage surgery. Or if you want to make one-stage surgery, make sure you relieve the provisional denture efficiently. <coughs> it's very important, and I think that's really the most important thing, to establish a communication of high quality between uh, the clinicians. Usually I put in the imp do the implant surgery and another one does the provisional denture. And it's very important that they know they have to relieve the denture. And likewise, you need co a good communication with the patient because it's only humans. You never know what they're going to do. You tell them something, they do something else. You need to have your hygienist keeping them in a tight lease. And uh, <coughs> two of the implants we lost. That was a lady who lost... Um, the attachment in the overdenture in, on the anterior implants, and she didn't do anything about it. So she just went on using the overdenture, and of course, she overloaded the posterior implants. And that could have been so easily fixed if she were, had enough attention on that she needed to have these attachments replaced when losing them. We found out that this method can keep periimplantitis away. Sometimes the simplest things are the most beneficial. We instruct the patient in using a solo brush, dip it in chlorhexidin, give it a, a bash on the hand so it's not very much chlorhexidin, and then go through all four locators with this brush from only one dip of chlorhexidin. If they do that in the morning and in the evening, they won't get periimplantitis. That's my experience. <coughs> and we keep that very strict, so they visit the hygienist one week after, two weeks after, one month after, half a year if they can find, if they do it right, and then we only see them once a year after that. <coughs> Conclusion, the study demonstrates that a protocol using 
four on splinter dental implants supporting a maxilla complete over implant support over denture were associated with a high implant survival. These results were comparable to the report survival rates from protocols using four splinted implants supporting a maxilla complete over denture. Of course, we didn't quite meet it four years after, but I think we are very close still, so I would still recommend the treatment. And it's nice when you've done a treatment for so many years that you can actually say, well, it's, it's not that bad, it works. I know I've been speed talking and it's because I want to reach this point. Fixed or unfixed, removable. I told you I am a practitioner, so that's my point of view. I love being in a profession where we can change a life in four months. We can go from this situation, horrible situation, to this situation. This is with overdentures. <coughs> I came across this. This is a chair called the Ant Chair, designed by a Danish architect, Arne Jacobsen, in the 50s. As you see, it's a very bold design, very nice design, and he said, he said why does it a chair need four legs when you can have three legs. And nice design. But it works. You can sit on it comfortably, but when you have to reach for the salt, you might tip over, which can be a problem. So they still produce the chair, but now with four legs. If you are design free, you can still order it with three legs. And they adapted it, because life offers different situations. If you have a table in a lounge, you might need a higher chair and the legs become wobbly and then you can splint them or use it as a bar chair as well. So what I'm trying to say is use your toolbox when you have these indentalist patients. It might not just be the locator implant supported over the NJ, it could be something else as well. So this is my life. This is a sculpture displaying firewood on a wheelberry. I've been in the business for 22 years. I have piled a lot of cases up on my wheelberry. And they're all right, I think. But what happens when I start to walk along the road? The, the timeline with my cases. What will then happen? Will it all tip down and fall, crossing me, crossing my surgery? You have to think in long distance. <coughs> show you some cases. This is a full arch fixed bridge, upper and lower, porcelain in the maxilla, no composite, titanium composite, titanium acrylic in the lower. This was when, in 2008, when all the Palo from Portugal started with the all on four, all on six and all this, and I thought, why not do acrylic teeth on a, a fixed bridge, bridge like he does and make it a little bit cheaper for the patient and she was very happy. I was happy. I saw her two weeks ago. She looks like this. That's not ideal. She came because she fractured these. Of course she should have been provided with a splint many years ago or three or five years ago had the opportunity to get new acrylic teeth on the framework. I'm happy with the bone level though, but it opens a lot of questions for me. Did I keep the models and where are they? How do I temporize her while I fix the bridge? Can I use the framework again? Blah, blah, blah. Not easy. And not a thing. You don't want to do this. That's not funny. <laughs> it's 10 years along. You want to make new cases, new uh, developments. But you have to service your old patients. This is a patient that came to my practice. I do a lot of these repair cases. She had, her dentist had done a, a fairly okay bridge, full arch bridge in the maxilla. Is it easy to clean? I don't think so. She's got a partial denture in the lower. She obviously got severe periodontitis, uh, the periodontitis down here. He splintered the teeth down here. Is this ever going to work? She will for sure get peri-implantitis. She already got it. 
The question is not whether she's going to lose this bridge. The question is, will there be a bone enough for a complete denture? This is the all on six. It could be all on four. I get so many of these in my practice. And people say, what do I do now? They fracture after a few years and so on. And now they even developed it, so they put extra acrylic on the buckle for better phonetics, which is great. But how can this be a surprise? It's impossible to clean. You will 100% sure get periimplantitis. Another case. Is this too depressing? <laughs> no. Four years after he, this guy was pro provided with these bridges, he came to my office, he looked like this. Periimplantitis, massive. He's bound to get it here because they're so close, these implants. And it's starting down here, even though we all know there's more resist resistance pro uh, f to periodontitis and implantitis in, in the mandibular bone. So we took the bridge off, provided him with four new implants, left the canines in, which were okay. We could only get ball attachments for these, and then we provided him with an implant supported over denture. Sorry to say, this is one of my own cases, 2008. This broken down, broken down teeth. We had to do something about it, so we provided him with a full arch bridge on ankles implants up here. Single implants and a free unit bridge here. Everyone's happy. Only three years later, massive signs of periimplantitis. And today. And we just got to be aware that it's humans we're working on. We can't control them. He promised me he would stop smoking. That's what I'll say in court anyway. But uh, he didn't. He can't clean his teeth. He can use an electric toothbrush, but he never got the hang on the interproximal brushes. And this is where we are now. Hopefully we can save these. But we'll let him heal, take out these two, put four implants in, making a complete overdenture, implant supported. <coughs> Why didn't I make him a bridge like this? I say to myself, I would have done that today. Uh, this is, I don't know if you know them, it's a conus bar. It gives an excellent tight fit. It feels like a fixed bridge, but you can take it out. And most people can learn how to clean this framework. At least it's a lot easier than cleaning uh, um, a fixed bridge. And we can provide him with excellent phonetics as well, which is very good. <coughs> This guy wanted fixed teeth. He wasn't very good at cleaning his teeth. We must realize that people that end up in dentalists, they're not very good at cleaning their teeth. If they lose them because of periodontitis or, uh, or periodontitis or broken down teeth or whatever, I mean, it all adds up. They're not very good teeth cleaners. So I said to him, well, let's start in the upper, which was the worst. And I convinced him that we could make this conus bar construction. And I said, let's start off cheap, and we'll do an overdenture on them. And this guy, he actually changed his attitude after meeting my lovely hygienist, or one of them. And when we reached 2017, he was actually a really good cleaner. And we said, well, now we go ahead in the lower. It's a small resistance to pure implantitis in the lower, so I said, okay, we do a fixed bridge, and I fitted this one only last week. You can see the ischemia here. <coughs> and I said, what, what do we do about the maxilla now? Should we change that to a removable bridge? Or I said, well, I'm perfectly happy with the implant-supported overdenture I got. He didn't say exact those words, but that's what it ended up with, and he's happy. I'm happy because I know I can keep him safe. If he breaks teeth, he can spend two hours at the lab, have a new tooth put on, or all the teeth even, and that's it. It's very easy to maintain. But if you do these implants supported over dentures, you have to do them right. I had this case just one month ago, came into my practice, he used to have a ball attachment here, 
This is iPhone photo, so it's not so good, but okay. He broke that attachment off. You can see it's here. But still, there's no posterior support on this implant-supported Ovidentia. It's got five straw man implants, so we removed this root and put two posterior implants in. And you wonder why didn't he put those in in the first place? But once they're healed, we'll probably cover up the middle implant here and do six locators here and a, a new implant supported Ovidentia. And then we will have a look into this tooth. <coughs> this is pretty much the protocol at our practice today. We do four implants in the upper, place the posterior implants as posterior as we can, and four in the lower. This patient had severe periodontitis. You can see her dentist has splintered all her teeth, put implants in and two implants down here. She's lost these implants, lost a lot of bone here. I would never do a splintered bridge on her. I would do unsplinted because it's very easy, very so much easier to clean. So we put in immediately four implants in the maxilla, four in the mandibular, left the two canines in to retain the provisional partial denture in the lower. And three months later, re-entered and fitted the locators on and removed the canines. And she ended up like this way. Uh, and this is back to the ant chair. It works with two locators. It works with three locators. But it's much more stable if you've got four. So if they can afford it, we do four. That's our protocol now. This woman had migraines, headaches, she was always feeling tired. And when you look at her x-ray and see how much infection she has in her mouth, no wonder. But I don't know, at least in Denmark, it's like medical doctors, they don't really connect to the teeth. And you, you wonder why. Now she has a whole different life. She can smile. She's secure. Her teeth are fixed. She can take them out and clean them. She probably won't get periimplantitis again, and her headaches are gone. So my recommendations as a practitioner is the intentionless patient with a history of aggressive periodontitis must always be rehabilitated with unsplinted implants supported over dentures to facilitate a sufficient oil hygiene and thereby reduce the risk of periimplantitis. For any other play, maxilla and dentalist patient always recommend some kind of removable solution to facilitate sufficient oral hygiene and thereby reduce periimplantitis. Periimplantitis is the killer. And if you want to carry your wheelberry through life as a dentist, implant dentist, make it easy for yourself. <coughs> Base your decisions on reality. And just a little advice to get through this profession, have a hobby, play golf, go fishing, whatever, to keep your mind off the patients. I go to my garage in the evenings, take the paint off my Jaguar E-type, refurbish the interior and so on and so forth. It's not only a four months job, this took me three years, but it's good for your mind, it keeps you at ease. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> yeah, oh God. <laughs> I'll leave. <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, wonderful lecture. Is there any questions about the recommendations and about the data he has kept on his uh, Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, not really. No. It's I think as I said before um at least two of them were lost because they lost the attachment in the denture. Uh, at the anterior implant, so you get an overload. So it's very important that they are w when they look at their denture, when they clean it two twice every day, and they make sure that 
the attachments are in place. So you have to uh, make sure that they do that and they understand the importance of it. That's a weak point. Um, the other thing is that uh, the more we've done these treatments, the more we become aware that it's so important that we get the posterior implant as posterior as possible. Because before we, some of the cases in the study, they might be close to the canine region. And that's just too far anterior because you get a too strong a mechanical lever arm. Sometimes if there's bone posterior to the sinus, I might put the implants there, the posterior implants in region seven. Um, so you do develop as you go along, yeah. Just a conventional acrylic uh, complete denture <laughs> or a partial denture. Huh? It, it, it is, and, and some of them, they come from, some of them have complete denture for all their life, more or less. But a lot of them comes from periodontitis, uh, periodontitis, sorry. And uh, are used to having the teeth, even though they weren't that good. And it's very nice giving them the experience of a complete denture for three months. That would make them appreciate an implant supported over denture even more. I tell uh, you. And I would like to know your opinion about uh, if you put the implants, do you set the implants a little bit subcrestal because the full prosthesis usually kill a little bit, a little bit bone above? Uh, I, always, I always place implants subcrestal, okay. at least that's one millimeter. That's, that's yeah. good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to check there at the end, it kind of seems counterintuitive to me, but um, in, in your understanding, you're saying for perio patients to not splint them together, yeah, to not exactly. do your conus bar. If, if, if it's a severe perio, I, I say, because it's, it's so easy to get perioimplantitis if, if you've got the, a history of periodontitis. It's so easy. If you use the solo brush two, twice a day, it's very easy to get around these locators, and everybody can learn that. But a framework, it's more difficult. It's easier than a fixed bridge, but, and, and I find it, it works really well, and they hardly any get periimplantitis. It's, it's really uh, a revelation for me, yeah? <laughs> But if we have like a fixed bridge or we have fixed uh, procedures over implant, yeah. this can affect your final treatment. Like for example, the force distribution, matter of fact, we had like very quiet failure and over denture when we have a fixed solid occlusion yeah. from the lower. Uh -huh. But with denture, we never had any failure. No. Maybe one because the very very uh, implantitis, but most likely it's just coming from the occlusion force distribution. It's a key. What do you feel about that? Uh, your experience is that overloading is what you lose the implants on. Is that what you're saying? Or? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, s some of the patients uh, I provide with a, with a, a soft night guard, actually, to to lessen the, the pressure on the implant support or and on the implants. And we find that works. So, yeah. One question more? Yeah. Last one? Never. Never, no. I, I'm too old for immediate loading. <laughs> I, I sometimes I do I, I do it on on front teeth, when when I I love doing immediate uh, implantation and temporization on on uh, on teeth in the aesthetic zone, but on these cases where it's a bridge or whatever molar tooth I, I don't 
I don't take that risk anymore. I did when I was younger. For me, it's very much keeping my life simple and easy and relaxed as an implant dentist. And I think when I was when I was younger, I sound like a very old man. I'm a little older than you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> But um, my concept of success was how many full arch bridges could I do? How much advanced bone augmentation could I do? And so on and so forth. And it's great in some cases, but pick your cases very carefully because they will come back and haunt you for the next many years. <laughs> Fortunately, a lot of our patients have reached some age, so some of them disappears. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you, I'm, well, it's, it's completely wrong to say it, but some of my full arch bridges are fortunately not here anymore. So I don't have to deal with that problem anymore. But it made, made me wiser, and I hope I can pass that on so you don't make the same mistakes. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> So now we have uh, the NAS, the last, uh, next uh, alumni. Um, he is graduating this year, and uh, it's uh, Daniel Saad. And he will uh, tell you about the content of his master thesis with the title Association between Periimplant Health and Periimplant Keratinized Mucosa, a one year retrospective cohort study. And he will present now the, his data. Thank you for coming and presenting your master thesis. So is the break actually? I have this one. Is there a uh, lower <laughs> set?
like to see the rest of the presentation as well. <laughs> yeah. So, on a case like this, where the patient has super strong muscles, of course, we could, yeah, uh, we need to do a, uh, here's, this is an uh, imaging software that my technician uses to show the patient. Eins. 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 Zwei, drei, vier. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, eins. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, eins. Eins. Zwei, drei, eins. Eins, zwei, drei, eins. Eins. Zwei, drei, vier, eins. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, eins. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, eins, eins. Eins, zwei, drei, vier. Ich 
War keine Lüftung mehr. Test, Test, 1, 2, Test, 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 Test. Hallo Safi, hallo Safi. Ein Test, ein wunderschöner Soundtest. Soundtest, Soundtest, Soundtest. Ich spreche leise.